the book of Revelation, chapter 3. In fact, on this particular occasion, I will uh, read from a parallel of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I am standing at your heart's door, knocking. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door will be glad, for I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. He who overcomes will receive the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I've entitled our study for this occasion, House Calls. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are grateful once again for the opportunity to open the word. There are some who don't have this privilege, and they long for it. But today, because it is ours, we are grateful. Our hearts are glad, and we dare not sit in silence when the power of the Holy Spirit moves through this place. I only ask, Father, in public what I have asked in private, that all that I have and all that I am may be converted to thy use. And I pray that we shall hear on this day a word from the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I was shocked when I really thought about it. I'm sure everybody has read this text before, and somehow we reduce the Bible. We bring it down to our own size. But the Bible says that Jesus, in fact, Jesus declares of himself, I stand at the door of your heart, and I stand here knocking. The scholars make it clear that this is not the door of proffered opportunity. This is not the door of salvation. Man does not have the power over those doors. But there is a door that God will not control, and that's the door of my heart. When you think about it, as the Creator, He could knock down the door. He could force His way into your life. But Jesus stands at the door of my heart powerless because He has limited Himself and will not force me to let him in. He gives me the right to keep the door closed. And I'm sad to say that some people do. Jesus comes to the heart, and you, you can put it in Revelation's symbolism if you want to, but this is real. This is the Son of God having already died on Calvary. And that punctuates it for me. How in the world, after Jesus has given everything, after he gave up heaven and came and pitched his tent next to mine and then gave his life in that horrible death, what in the world is, is he doing now knocking at my door? I tell you, this is a revelation of his love for us. He loves us enough that he died for us. And to be honest with you, that should be enough. After the death of Jesus on Calvary, we ought to be knocking at his door. We ought to be trying to find him. The world should be the path to wherever Jesus is. But instead, some of us are reluctant. Some of us, even after hearing the story, the pain and suffering that he went through, we are still reluctant, and so we stay in our own homes. We will not venture out, and since we won't come, I don't know, I... I can't put myself in the place of Jesus, but if I try to imagine it, I can't imagine myself coming to your door after such a sacrifice. I'd wonder what was wrong with you. I'd wonder whether you knew what I'd just done for you. I'd wonder whether you understood that you were lost until I came and died in your place. I'd wonder whether you understood that without my living a perfect life, not one of you would have an opportunity to gain heaven. For all of our righteousness says are like filthy rags. Every good thing we've done, Jesus did what we could not do, put himself in our places so that he could put us in his place. 
And yet there are some who don't feel any inclination to move towards Jesus. So what does Jesus do? Does he sit down and say, forget about him? I don't know about you. I think it would be appropriate if Jesus said, that's it. <laughs> if that's not enough, I can't do any more. I think everyone would say, that's justified. But love doesn't make sense in a normal fashion. Love never stops giving. Love never stops reaching. And until we really understand what the love of Jesus is like, we cannot comprehend it all. But I tell you this, if Jesus did all he did and then comes to my door, I get another picture of who Jesus is. I, I'll tell you that I, uh, I think I have an insight into what Jesus goes through knocking on doors. I served uh, while I was a student at this very institution. I, I was what they called then a literature evangelist. Let me break that down. There are people who are listening who will not understand the euphemism. What it means is that you are selling books and periodicals door to door. It's called a cold call. It's the hardest thing a salesman has to do. To knock on a door, never having met the people before, it takes everything in you to be able to do it. Even great salespeople are reluctant to try it. In fact, these days, it almost never happens. Since 9-11, people don't open their doors so quickly. And so most companies have given up on cold calls. There are a few still out there. In fact, I, I don't want to sound braggadocious, but I think I still have enough left over that I might be able to get in the door or two. My father taught me some secrets. He said, uh, when you go to the door, this is from another era, of course. He said, when you go to the door, knock on it and then step back so that when they come to the door and look through the people, they can see all of you. They can see that you don't have a hidden weapon. They can see that you are a regularly formed human being. They can see your smile. They can understand what you are about. They can determine from your body language that you are not harmful. And so when they open the door after you've stepped back, then move as though you're going to come in whether they invite you or not. <laughs> Believe it or not, in the old days, that used to work. Many a time I had a big towering figure of a man just open his door because I was coming anyway I moved like the door wasn't there and he'd step back and let me in and when I got in he'd look surprised that he had done that <laughs> it was part of my method but these days unless you just want to to give yourself up to punishment unless you love rejection nobody does cold calls but here is Jesus doing the thing that makes you most vulnerable to the rejection of those whom you love he comes and knocks on the door in fact I read just last night a, another version from a scholar who had studied the text and he says that Jesus not only stands there and knocks but he will not relent in his knocking in fact this writer said, Jesus is willing to let the dew wet his hair. In other words, he's willing to knock until nightfall. He doesn't just knock, he calls your name at your door. And he does it because there is no pride in him that is greater than his love for you. So with his everything exposed, Jesus knocks on doors. And you can listen to this as though it doesn't matter if you want to, but the fact is that every individual under the sound of my voice has had the opportunity to have Jesus knock at your door. He knocks on these worship occasions. He knocks while you're sitting there nonchalantly. He knocks while you're worried about whether your clothes match. He knocks while you are thinking about who's sitting next to you. He knocks while you're not even comprehending the dynamics of worship in God's house. 
He knocks not because you deserve it. He knocks because he loves you. And his love will not let you go. Forgive me if I am shocked by it. I know me pretty well. The only one who knows me better than I do is God. But if I knew about me, what I know about me, I wouldn't knock at my door. I'm not the one you're looking for to make up a perfect kingdom. But Jesus, knowing our imperfections, understanding our weaknesses, still loves us enough to expose himself to rejection. And he does it because he loves us. He, he is, in fact, a salesman. I, I want to get to that, but let me tell you something that Jesus wants to do that is not ordinary for a salesperson. The Bible says Jesus offers not only to come into your house, but he kind of wants to get to know you. He wants to share time with you. And I'm sure when you think about all the things you'd have to put away if Jesus knocked at the door. In fact, maybe that's why he's knocking so long. Maybe he hears the sounds of rearranged furniture. Maybe he knows that there are some things that can't stay out in the open if you're going to let him in. But he's knocking anyway. He understands that you may be trying to make adjustments, but his love does not focus on what you've got on your coffee table. His love focuses on you and how valuable you are to him. So it's not the things that surround you. In fact, he already knows those things. He has not come to your house because it's an example of perfect living. He's come to your house because his love will not let him leave you alone. And he knocks and he says, here's what I want to do. I, I'm not like a regular salesman. I don't want to burst your bubble. But when you are at the mall and the salesperson is acting like you are the only human being in the universe. And they do that for a while. Any good salesperson will focus on you. They will close out the world. And all of a sudden, you are the only person who exists. At least that's the way you're supposed to feel if it's a good salesperson. And for a moment, you say, oh, isn't this wonderful? You are transported into another existence. You're in a parallel universe. And all they think about is you. Oh, look at, you know, this matches your clothes. Have you ever thought about that? Let's put it up next to you. Isn't that something? And people are all around you, but they don't see them. They only see you. I hate to burst your bubble, but they really don't care about you. It's the sale. The only reason they're focused on you is because you got the money. If they thought you didn't have the money, you would blend into the crowd. Trust me. In fact, when they think you have the money, and they think a contract is about to be signed, then all the focus is there. But as soon as the sale is consummated, you will drift back into the gray of anonymity. You don't matter, because all they were about was the sale. Now, I hate to say that about everybody. There may be some salesperson who really likes you, but I doubt it. <laughs> Jesus is not an ordinary salesperson. He's making cold calls, but he says, I don't want to just get in your house and sell something and get to the next door. I want to come in and get to know you. How in the world? Knowing as much as he already knows about me, how in the world can he want to get to know me better? What is it about me that would interest Jesus? And the answer is strange. He is inclined to us. There is something that draws him to us. It's not what we have done. It's not what we possess. It's not our status. It's not any of the things that are normal. It's just that we are precious to him. So he is inclined to us, not because of us, but because of his love. And he says, I want to come in. I want to get to know you. Now, this next part is... Uh, is not going to apply to everybody. He says, I want to eat with you. 
There are cultures where uh, we know that mealtime is not only about nutrition. In fact, uh, the struggle that I've had all my life with weight has much to do with the fact that eating is not only about just keeping body and soul alive. Eating in the community where I grew up meant way more than that. It was a social event. My grandfather could cook. My grandmother could cook. My grandmother made cornbread that she put in an iron container that looked like ears of corn. And she would pour cornmeal lovingly into each little place, and when it popped out, it looked like cornbread shaped like corn. My brother and I were amazed at her love. In fact, there were times when we would, we would just sit there and watch her cook. I know you don't understand that. It's, a, it's something from days gone by. There's nothing that interesting about a microwave and a can opener. <laughs> but food processors notwithstanding, I used to watch my father, my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother, prepare food with personal touch. There was love in the process. My grandmother made some cookies that tasted like angels had baked them. The only reason I didn't think they did is because I saw grandmother do it. My brother and I would sit there, and she'd say, go out and play. We said, no. She said, but they're not going to be ready. We'll stay. She'd get through mixing the batter. And we say, Grandmother, can I have it this time? And they can't get it. Oh, somebody knows. <laughs> I can't get it. Ow. My brother and I would fight over the turns. Said, My turn. Leave me some. Yeah, okay. I'm going to leave you some, all right. We'd watch, and sometimes I'd sit there and watch my mother as I now watch my wife. You know, I, I, I hate it when people say that someone is a good cook and they gloss over it. In order to be a good cook, I believe you have to think through the whole process how much you love somebody. Because there's no joy in this. I, I've seen my wife do that little thing where you hold it like that and put that knife in front of it. And I'm sitting there, Lord, please don't let her cut her fingers off. And... And what I'm thinking about that is she must really love us to go through this repetitive, boring process. You've got to be thinking not about what you're doing right now. You've got to be thinking about the finished product. You've got to be imagining what the aroma will be like when all of those things come together. And when a person is a good cook, they know how to love people. You've got to love people to cook well. Because only love can drive you to do those things. I've seen them. In fact, a couple of times I've tried. Somehow my love got lost in the process. <laughs> but cooking means love. And can you imagine that Jesus in his culture understands that one of the most intimate things that you can share with a friend is a meal. Now, if you are not part of one of those cultures, just hold on a minute. Go and do something for about five or ten minutes and come back and be with us because I know some of you have never understood this and never will. Uh, the upside for you is that you probably don't struggle with your weight. We who know that there's something more in food than nutrition kind of work with that because there are times when you eat when you're not hungry. You're not hungry physically, but you're hungry emotionally. You're hungry socially. You want to share something. I, I have shared food with people. My brother is the one who did it most because we were always together. We're not far apart in our birth dates, and, and so we eat things and not have to use words. We'd be eating some sweet potato pie. Oh, I hope you know what it tastes like. If you don't, you can go to your grocery store and find something that reminds you of sweet potato pie. It is not the genuine article, but my brother and I would get some sweet potato pie and sit at the table and look at each other. We 
read this then. Mm. And that had a whole paragraph in it. There was connection. My mom would put together beans and rice. Now, I know you think that's poor people's food. So I guess I am still very poor. Because when my wife puts her hand to it, and then let's not even talk about greens. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. You think I'm talking about salad. <laughs> I'm talking about kale and turnips and collards and... Huh? There are ways that you can intermingle them and put them at the right temperature with just enough moisture. And after a while, they'll begin to drive you out of your mind. They'll seep all the way through the house. In fact, if you go to a place where a cook has been at work, the aroma is not only in the kitchen, it's in the living room drapes. It's in the sofa. It's in the carpet. When you come in the house, they don't have to say, are you hungry? You may not have been hungry when you came in, but something happens when you get in there. And here's what Jesus is saying. I want to share that phenomenon with you. You go look it up if you think I'm adding something that's not there. Jesus is saying, I don't want to just pass through your house like an ordinary salesman. I want to share something intimate with you. And incidentally, if you don't have enough in your house to share, it just so happens that Jesus has been proven to be able to multiply what you've got to eat. Matthew chapter 14, starting about verse 14 or 15, you remember that there was a crowd gathered listening to him preach. And the disciples came and said, let them go because they're getting hungry. They're going to turn ugly on us. Jesus said, don't worry about it. Just tell them to sit down in organized fashion have we got anything? They say, well, all we got, Jesus, is a little boy with a lunch. He's got barley loaves and fish spread. And he said, just bring that to me, and I'll thank God before we begin. They said, we are in trouble. They did whisper to themselves and say, there's something wrong. He doesn't understand the disaster that is upon us. And what they didn't know was that Jesus had already thanked his father for multiplying a little boy's lunch. I wish I had been there. I wish I could have sat there and watched his hands as he broke those barley loaves and said, bring me another basket. And he kept breaking, bring me another basket. Until all of those men and their wives and their children, some estimate 25,000 human beings, all of them had been filled and there were baskets full left over. So if you invite Jesus to your house, you don't have to worry whether you're going to run out of food. All you got to do is say, Jesus, we don't have enough. Let him break up a few things. Yeah. You don't have to worry that your skill in the kitchen is not enough. You may remember that the disciples came back from fishing one day. Looked at the shore and saw food that was already cooked, a fire that was lit, and there was a meal that was ready to be eaten. And when they looked around to see who might have cooked it, the only one there was Jesus. So if you can't cook, bring him in the kitchen. If you don't have the skill, he can help you there. If you don't have the quantity, he can help you there. But what Jesus says is, forget about the process. Let's enjoy together as mealtime comes. The scholars say he's not talking about some snack. He wants to come at the evening meal. He wants the chief meal, and he wants to sit there. What must it be like to look across a table into the eyes of Jesus and watch him taste something and nod his head approvingly? Wouldn't that make it taste a lot better? Now, you think I'm making too much of it? I am not. What Jesus wants with us, and I'm talking about you with all of your flaws, you with all of your hidden weaknesses. We try to hide from Christ that which he sees so easily. And all he asks is that you let him in, and he can make up for the difference 
the meal will be the best that you've ever tasted if you let him get involved. And then you'll sit there together and the intimacy of a meal will draw you together with Jesus. It's not what you have requested. It's what Jesus wants. Now, when you look at that, you've got to understand that cold call sales are still difficult. In fact, this is what amazes me when I look at the story. Jesus could have gone anywhere to show that he knocks on doors. Uh, when you look at this particular passage, you discover that he has come to a city called Laodicea. Laodicea is not the town you want to visit. Join us next time on Breath of Life for more of Pastor Pearson's message entitled House Calls. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did something especially for you. He got up on a cross at Calvary and died. That day, you were on his mind. Our offer this week is Max Lucado's He Did This Just For You. This easy-to-read, entertaining, and inspiring book reveals what God did to win your heart. Let Max Lucado beautifully lay out the way home to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Call today and ask for He Did This Just For You. It's yours for a gift of $5 or more. The toll-free number is 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. Or you may ask for the book by writing to Breath of Life, Post Office Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. Remember to include your gift of $5 or more. Come up close and personal with the passion and promise of God Almighty in He Did This Just For You. To order a CD or audio cassette copy of this Breath of Life broadcast, just call our toll-free number, 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. The CD or audio cassette is yours for a gift of $5 or more. If you'd like to purchase a DVD or VHS copy, just let us know. Thank you for watching and supporting Breath of Life. sit in silence when the power of the Holy Spirit moves through this place. I only ask, Father, in public what I have asked in private, that all that I have and all that I am may be converted to thy use, and I pray that we shall hear on this day a word from the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I was shocked when I really thought about it. I'm sure everybody has read this text before, and somehow we reduce the Bible. We bring it down to our own size. But the Bible says that Jesus, in fact, Jesus declares of himself, and opens the door, will be glad, for I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. He who overcomes will receive the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I've entitled our study for this occasion, House Calls. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are grateful once again for the opportunity to open the word. There are some who don't have this privilege and they long for it. But today, because it is ours, we are grateful, our hearts are glad, and we dare not... Breath of Life presents Relentless Pursuit with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr.
the book of Revelation, chapter 3. In fact, on this particular occasion, I will uh, read from a parallel of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I am standing at your heart's door, knocking. Anyone who hears my voice, and I'm sad to say that some people do, Jesus comes to the heart, and you, you can put it in Revelation's symbolism if you want to, but this is real. This is the Son of God having already died on Calvary, and that punctuates it for me. How in the world, after Jesus has given everything, after he gave up heaven and came and pitched his tent next to mine and then gave his life in that horrible death, what in the world is, is he doing now knocking at my door? I tell you, this is a revelation of his love for us. He loves us enough that he died for us. And to be honest, I stand at the door of your heart and I stand here knocking. The scholars make it clear that this is not the door of proffered opportunity. This is not the door of salvation. Man does not have the power over those doors. But there is a door that God will not control. And that's the door of my heart. When you think about it, as the creator, he could knock down the door. He could force his way into your life. But Jesus stands at the door of my heart powerless because he has limited himself and will not force me to let him in. He gives me the right to keep the door closed.